Okay, we're in Romans chapter 6. We start reading in verse 15 as we uh, go through our uh, study of Romans. We'll be looking at uh, being slaves to righteousness, looking at what it means to be a Christian essentially, to not be under the law, but to be under grace. So let us read 15 through 23. Chapter 6, 15 through 23. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves? You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you were once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to the lawless leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's word for God's people. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for grace and mercy this morning, this evening, Lord, today, all day, you have given us grace. We praise you, God, that uh, you have uh, been with us, you have guided us, you have guarded us, Lord, you have kept us. And we praise you for it, Lord. We pray that you continue to keep us, to keep us strong. And Lord, for a time we pray that you will keep us connected, though we are unable to be with one another. So Father, I, I praise you, God, and thank you that you have given us all life. And Lord, that Jesus is worthy of our praise this morning for the sacrifice, for the grace and mercy that he has offered. So Father, today as we study your word, I pray that you teach us, show us your ways, that we may not sin against you. In Christ's name, amen. So what we've been talking about is dead to sin and alive to God. We're talking about dying to the old ways of life and being raised to a new way of life. A new creature in Christ, as John, uh, so, so in John 3, talked about Jesus telling Nicodemus to be born again. To be born again, to be made new, to be made alive in Christ Jesus. And today we're going to be talking about slavery to righteousness. Slavery is a something we, we don't understand in today's world. Uh, we only have a concept of what it meant to be a slave a hundred, couple hundred years ago. But now as we look at slavery, we go all the way back to uh, the beginning of the New Testament, to that, that time some 2,000 years ago, slavery was pretty common. And even a lot of people would sell their sl selves into slavery to get out of debt or, or something similar to that. So slavery was not what we think of it today, but it was a, it was a pretty common thing to be a, a slave back then. There were many, many slaves of all nationalities and all races. And so what we have to look to uh, is Luke 17, verse 7. This is what Jesus said of the unworthy slaves or the unworthy servants. 17.7 starts, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the slave because he did what he was commanded? 
So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have only done what is our duty. A slave does not earn anything. A slave does what they do because they have given themselves to slavery, to their master. So this is the way we need to think. And this is the, the, the thinking of Paul. This is what Paul's been going through all of this time because you have to remember, Judaism at that time was a, a works-based uh, religion, and still probably today is. But any religion that is works-based says that you work for something and you get something in return. This is the total opposite of what Paul's preaching uh, about Christianity. It's completely opposite because uh, we earn nothing. The only thing we have earned is death in hell. And this is what Paul's trying to say. So this is the reason he's using the slave analogy here when it comes to being slaves of righteousness. If you have been saved, then you are a slave to righteousness. You are a slave to the one who has saved you. That's why Paul would open most of his, his letters with Paul, an apostle and a slave to Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that uh, that term is not used in the New Testament in the English version, doulos. But it should be used because it means what it means, a slave. One that has been bought, one that has been sold into something. And uh, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under the law, verse 15? This is very similar to verse 1 in, in, in the beginning of this chapter. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He phrases it a little different here, and for a very good reason. Because now we're talking about not being under the law. He says, so since we're not under the law, are we to sin? Is it okay to sin, is what he's saying. Is it okay to sin since we're not under the law? Is it okay to sin, but... We're under grace. He says, by no means. We should not sin just because we're not under the law. Because, he uses a slave analogy, verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Once again, Paul is hammering home the point that freedom from the law does not mean freedom to sin. We make known what enslaves us. It reveals the state of the person as to whether they have become slaves of Christ or are still slaves of sin. Has Jesus freed you? This is the question that Paul's bringing out. To the Jew, he's trying to say, you don't work for your salvation. To the Gentile, he's trying to say, you cannot just sin because you think you're not under the law. So these, it, it's, a two, it's a twofold here because he's preaching to both people. We know that there were Jews in the Roman church as well as Gentiles. So he's trying to say, you had not earned anything because you've done good things. They don't earn you salvation. Salvation is given to you by grace. And through that grace, you will do good things. Just because you're not under the law doesn't mean you're free to sin. Do you not know that, he says? Present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves. You are a slave to the one you obey. Who do you obey is the question. This is Paul's call for us to take an inventory of our life. Who do you obey? Do you obey Christ? If you have been bought by Him, Jesus is your master. If not, sin is still your master. You have a master, is what Paul's trying to say. You are a slave, is what Paul's trying to say. No one is a free man in this world. You're either born into sin, and you live in it and obey it, or you've been born again into righteousness, and you live in it and obey it. What do you obey, is the question he's asking. This is not just an outward obedience to the law. This is another point that needs to be made, and we've been making this point throughout the book of Romans because Paul has been making this point. The law is sim simply outward obedience. You can follow a law, and that's an outward obedience. I can see that you're following the law. I say, okay, you're following the law. That's an outward obedience. 
But Paul's talking about an inward obedience. An obedience that comes only from the inside, which means you've been changed on the inside by Christ Jesus. A heart change that leads to a true life change. A heart change. This is important when we look at our lives. Who, who do we obey is the question we're asking. Either of sin, Paul says, which leads to, what, death? Or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, he says, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient. Paul is presuming and making an assumption that those that are listening have been changed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Those that are listening will take an inventory of their life. He says, thanks be to who? Not you, not the things that you've done, but to God. That is, God, a sovereign God in salvation. Only God causes you to persevere. Only God saves you. Only God gives you grace. Only God sets you free from sin. Only He can set you free from the chains of sin. On your own, you are powerless to sin. This is the point he's trying to make. It's God's work in you that has changed you. It's not that you've changed yourself. But once you have been changed, he says, now you were once slaves to sin. This is past tense. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer bound by sin. You are able now to overcome sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. You who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. This is the difference between an outward obedience and an inward obedience. Fleshly obedience and adherence to rules means nothing and can be imitated and even make one think that they are saved. You can follow rules and think you're saved and you not be saved. I know many people that think they're Christians that actually look better than most people that, um, that are true Christians in some sense. They have an outward obedience that has been trained in them for years since they were very little, very young. They're taught to follow rules. And nothing wrong with following the rules. No, I'm not, a, I'm not uh, advocating rule breaking. But, but the point is, you can imitate that and look very good at doing it. But only a hard change can be attributed to true salvation and only God can do that. Only God can make you obedient from the heart. Not just that you're able to follow rules but that you want to do what is right by God. You want to seek God in all His ways and you're happy in doing so. You're not begrudging God's laws. To the standard of teaching, he says, to which you were committed. Are you committed to the teaching of God? This is what I say, and I get in trouble for saying it, but doctrine is very important. Proper doctrine. Doctrine, the teaching of doctrine in the church is something we don't do any longer. Because no one wants to talk about doctrine because everyone says, well, doctrine divides. Doctrine does not divide. It brings us together. Matter of fact, if we have proper doctrine, we're all under the same doctrine. We all have the same thoughts, the same ways. We all think the same way in the sense of God and His teachings. Proper doctrine is a sign of the Holy Spirit teaching us the true ways of God. Paul, time and time again, emphasized that we should teach sound doctrine. The Spirit is one, and God's people are exhorted to not be divided in the understanding of doctrine, but be brought together under one teaching, one way, one spirit. Part of sanctification process is learning God's Word. It's learning God's doctrine. That's what God's Word is. It's His teachings. That's what the word doctrine means. It simply means teaching. We are learning God's ways. Not only learning them, but we're applying them to our lives. We're applying them to everyday life. I want you to think about think about what's going on right now with the isolation that everybody is in, which I think is a good thing. I think um, I've had many people question my faith this week because I decided not to um, not to have a church gathering for the next week, maybe two, not sure. 
maybe longer than that. I don't know. And, uh, brother, don't you have faith in God? And I absolutely I have faith in God. Absolutely, I believe God is uh, in control of all things. But I also believe God uh, does not want to be tempted. Jesus Himself told Satan, "It is not good that we tempt God. He should not be tempted." Coming together in a time when we are being told not to come together, and henceforth the the Lord is 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 allowing whatever's going on is taking place. Many people said, "Oh, this is the devil that's doing these things." Well, if it is the devil, it's only because God is allowing him to do so, and He has a purpose for it, a reason for it. And the thing is. We need to be able to be content in whatever situation we're in. Paul said that it's something that we learn. If you not being able to go to church for a couple of weeks just causes you to completely fall away, you've got a problem. You're not content with God and His Word. There were many times when Paul was walking in a cell all alone. He didn't have the fellowship of the body but he was content because God was with him there we need to be content in these times we need to not buck against what's going on in today's world there are very smart people that are telling us we need to stay away from each other for a little while that's okay I am content knowing that God is working even in this situation we should we should be okay with that. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk to each other. Man, we got all kinds of ways of communicating. We got FaceTime and Facebook and this and that and phones and, and it's just amazing how we can stay in contact. We need to stay in contact. We also need to think about getting back to normal. Acting like it's normal now is not going to get us back to normal. We need to act like there's something going on. We need to be careful and be aware. We need to quit adding to the problem. So hopefully in a few weeks, a month or so, we'll be able to get back to normal. God, give us a brain. Be smart. The Spirit is one and God's people are one. We exhort it not to be divided in the understanding of doctrine. Part of the sanctification process is learning God's Word and applying it to one's life. How can you walk in God's ways if you don't know what He has said? How can you be content if you don't understand who God is in all situations? Your understanding of God affects everything that you do in life and every situation that you're in. It affects you if you understand God to be a sovereign God, to be in control of all things. No matter what situation you're in, you know it's God who has made this situation for you. And you are okay with that. And you are content. If you don't know God and His ways, you will not grow in holiness. You will be led astray by every wind of doctrine. You will believe anything that everybody, everybody tells you about God's Word if you don't study His Word. I've seen it. I've lived it. I've been there. This standard of teaching is God's Word. It's His doctrine. It's understanding who God is. Verse 18 says, And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. There's that word doulos. You were born to be a slave. You were born to be a slave. I was born to be a slave. We're all slaves to something. Your master is either God or Satan. You are either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. You are a slave to self or you are a slave to God and His people. 
You're self-centered or you're God-centered. Who is your master? I am speaking, Paul says, in human terms because of your natural limitations. We don't really understand what all this talk about being a slave is, do we? We don't really understand what it means to be a slave to righteousness. To be a slave to Jesus Christ. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Your members, your body, your whole body. This is not just about being super spiritual. I know people say, well, you know, I'm all about, I'm not about religion, I'm about spirituality. I guess there's a little truth in that. But what we do in the body counts. It's not just about what you do on Sunday mornings. If you have this supernatural uh, spiritual event that takes place. Many people have that. Many people think they're saved because they one time had some kind of event take place in their life. Some kind of spiritual thing that may have taken place. But let me tell you something. If your body doesn't get in line with that spiritual event, if your members doesn't get in line with that spiritual event that you say saved you, you're not saved because the whole body is affected by salvation. What you do, what you say, how you act is affected by salvation. It changes you, your whole body. You change as a person. You are no longer you. You are in Christ. You are a slave to Christ. See, you once presented your members, your whole body, as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. That's all. That's what happens. Lawlessness begets lawlessness. Sin begets more sin and more sin. Sin is lawlessness. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is lawlessness. John writes in 1 John 3, 4. The more you sin, the more you want to sin, and then you got to up the ante. you got to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what Paul says you once did. That should be what you say if you're a Christian. You once did this. I once gave my members, my whole self, to impurity, to lawlessness. My mind, my body, everything. So he says, now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. The more we practice righteousness, the more we are sanctified. The more we do the right thing, the more we want to do the right thing. Thus, we are being sanctified by Christ. And I'm not talking about just doing it on the outside either, but wanting to do it on the inside. And then causing our members to act according to the inside. Being sanctified in Christ. Growing in holiness. Growing in sanctification. Are you growing in sanctification? Because if you're not growing in sanctification, it means you've never been saved. You've never repented. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ. Verse 20 says, For when we were slaves of sin, we were free in regard to righteousness. We had no care for righteousness when we were slaves to sin. We didn't want to do anything righteous. You serve sin. I serve sin. We all serve sin with all our might. And I'm one of those guys, I'm all in or all out. Always have me. And when I was out in the world, I was all in, man. Every bit of me, every part of me, every part of me. 
third scene with all my might. You and I, we did everything we could to please our sinful desires. Paul says, what did it get you? In the end, what did it get you? What did it get you? What fruit were you getting at the time of these things of which you are now ashamed? Where did it get you? I can tell you where it got me in a lot of trouble. The fruit of my desires. It almost destroyed my life. My family, my marriage. That's what it got me. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have been down that road. And you continue to go down that road. Because you continue to serve sin. And that's all you'll ever get. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same things and expecting different results? That's what Paul's talking about here. Doing the same thing, expecting things to get better. They're not going to get better until you begin to serve righteousness. How did sin repay you? <laughs> not very good. With destruction, that's how sin pays you. Sin brought pain, it brought misery in your life. It destroyed your relationships. It brought shame on you and took your name. You reap what you sow, the Bible says. And that's what I did. I reap what I sowed. I was a slave to sin. And I got exactly what it paid. But now, what have you been set free but now that you have been set free from sin verse 22 says and have become slaves of God he asked the question fruits get uh, you get leads to what sanctification and in sin it's really a question it's formed in a in a statement here but the question is does your fruits lead to sanctification are you being sanctified to be a slave to righteousness brings growth in your life. You begin to grow as a Christian. You're no longer a baby Christian. You begin to eat the meat. You're getting off the milk. You get wisdom. You get peace. You get knowledge. You get love. Righteousness heals. It mends. It restores. It brings you back together with those you have hurt. It, it brings the fruit of forgiveness. Righteousness builds up. It doesn't tear down like sin does. I'm telling you, sin tears down. God has set us free from sin. He has set us free from death. Our Father has made us alive in Christ Jesus. We no longer serve sin. We are slaves to righteousness. Our desire is to serve Jesus. We are no longer chained by sin and to sin. Those chains that once bound us to sin have been broken by the power of Christ and His work at the cross. The Holy Spirit now directs us. We are slaves to righteousness. We are slaves to Christ. And it shows because we are being sanctified. And its end is eternal life. Eternal life. Life forever with Jesus. Eternal life. Paul says the sufferings of this world does not even compare to the glory that God has prepared for us. This is a great opportunity. I was telling someone the other day in these times to share the gospel. Many people are saying, oh, the end's coming. I don't think the end's coming. Not quite yet. 
think this will pass. But as long as people are thinking that way, why not share the gospel? What's so scary about the end if you're a Christian? What's so scary about death if you have eternal life? This is the perfect time to be sharing the gospel. On your social media, on the phone, when you're talking to those you haven't talked to in a while, your, your kinfolk. A perfect time to be thinking about if this worthy. It's a perfect time. So you say, why is these why is these things happening? Well, we need to be sharing the gospel. God has put these things in place that His people may testify to the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. Verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul ends this section with a very strong point. He says the free gift. The free gift. As you and I go to work every day and we work for something. Our money. Slaves don't receive anything. They just do what they're supposed to do. They don't even get praise for it. That's what Jesus said, remember, in Luke 17, we just read. It says, the slave doesn't get thanks because he did what was commanded. We're not working for salvation. We've already got our wages. We've already got what we're owed way back in the beginning of Genesis. Our father Adam received the due for sin, death. Death's already a natural part of this world. We think about it. We don't think about it often enough. But even, even now, young people are thinking about it because of what's going on. The wages of sin is death, but God has given us a free gift in Jesus Christ. Receive the free gift. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. It's a free gift. And when you repent and trust Jesus Christ, you too can have the free gift. All you got to do is cry out to God and say, Wages is something you earn. That's what, that's what I earned in my sinful days. All that misery brought on by sin. Well, I earned it. I got exactly what I deserved. I deserved it too. I deserved worse, to be honest with you. But God's grace and His mercy was so good. My salvation was bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. The only thing I bought and paid for was sin and disobedience. Misery, destruction. And every time you'll disobey God, you earn more and more of His wrath, the Bible says. The Bible says that if you are not in Christ Jesus, you are a child of wrath. The wrath remains upon you. Praise God. Praise God, He saved us. Praise God, He's given us a free gift, Jesus Christ. Praise God, our debt has been paid. Jesus took the destruction, the misery, He took the wrath of God that we work for. We earn the wrath of God. And he took that and he gave us something far better. He took death and gave us life. 
He took sin and gave us righteousness. That's what Christ did. Repent today. Today is the day of salvation. Turn to Jesus. And become a slave of righteousness. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word.